Welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron, live interactive Bible study. We're a leader led by Pastor Douglas Banks out of Columbia, Maryland, and our facilitator is Minister Brenda Robb from Northern California. We're currently studying the book of Revelation. Come on in, have a seat, and study with us. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We want to come to you and be grateful this morning, thanking you and praising you for you are who you are. You're an awesome God, and you're worthy of all the praise. So, Father, we come to you this morning because we want to know more about you. You tell us, Father, in your word to study, to show our self approved a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but that can rightly divide the word of truth. As we begin to divide, Father God, if we get clarity, we get understanding, we can teach others, Lord God. We can be this light in this dark world, Father God, and the salt that does not lose its favor. So, Father God, we just praise you this morning for all that you do and all you continue to do, Father. In you, we move, we breathe, and have our being. Because, Father, without you, we are truly nothing. So, Father God, as we're led by the Spirit of uh, your Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Father God, and of understanding and wisdom and light and comfort, Father God, we decrease. So you can increase in every area. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, giving God praise, honor, and glory for one more time to come into his presence surrounded by the saints of God. Um, thanking God for iron sharpening iron. Um, each one has to know that the Spirit of God is in you individually and in all of us collectively. So we come together that the fire may burn brighter, higher, wider, and stronger because we've decided uh, that iron can sharpen iron. I want to thank God for our minister, Minister Brenda, who uh, facilitates this line uh, and uh, works so hard to ensure that the word of God goes forth in the name of Jesus. So we thank God for her, and we thank God for all the leaders that are on the line, and we bless God for each and every one that has come uh, into this place during what used to be called Holy Day season, uh, but somehow it got worldly transmuted into holiday season rather than Holy Day season. But for us, it's the same uh, thing. These holidays represent holy days to us who know the word of God. And so we welcome you uh, to Iron Sharpens Iron. Uh, understand that here in this sacred place, in this uh, sacred time, that God does indeed love you. He loves you. He loves you very, very much. And uh, we love you too in the name of Jesus. And so we are coming out of our study of the churches, the seven churches, and we are going into page 45 of our workshop, uh, work uh, book, part of our workshop, but our workbook, and we are taking off. We are going to uh, join John, uh, the revelator, in heaven. Many theologians believe that uh, this trip to the heavens uh, by John is so that he represents the church. He represents the rapture of the church. He represents you, 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 and me uh, standing before God uh, in uh, chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. So from now on, everything will be future tense. Uh, everything will be things that we have not seen yet uh, on the earth. First of all, heaven. And second of all, uh, uh, Jesus Christ coming to judge the earth and then to renew, redeem the entire earth as he has redeemed each and every one of us. So let's, let's get started. Let's get ready. Uh, move out and on up to heaven in God's throne room, the very throne room of the living God, the book of Revelation 4, 1 through 11. I'm going to need a reader for that, Revelation 4, 1 through 11. I'd like the reader to please read for us from either the uh, original King James or the new King James version, please. Pastor, this is Gloria. Um, are we not going to finish the 
the letters of the seven churches, we still had two left. I oh, think. we did have two left. You're right. Well, Gloria, thank God for you. <laughs> yes, we did have two left. I'm thinking that we finished it. Um, but, yes, we did have two left. You're right. So let's do that. Let's do that, and uh, then we will come back to uh, four. Thank you very much, Gloria. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and, oh, Lord, oh, I would have had to hear this from Sheila because she has Philadelphia. Yeah. And she, <laughs> oh, man, so... So you you saved me, Gloria. I would I would definitely have heard about this. Praise the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you you, you have secured pe- peace in my household. <laughs> Amen. All right, God is good. There's always a ram in the bush. <laughs> All right. So Sheila. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, would you tell us something about Philadelphia, the church at uh, Philadelphia, please? Yes. Before that, though, I just thought that you just uh, were going to do it another time, so I didn't bother saying anything. But I'm so glad that uh, – was that Cynthia? That did. Okay. Anyway, I did um, the church of, of, of uh, Philadelphia, and – Am I? Yeah. The church, uh, Saddle, the church that reminds me of is Saddleback Church in California. Saddleback Church is a evangelist, evangel, <laughs> evangelical mega church in California. Its pastor Rick Warren began to probe the people in his neighborhood to find out what prevented them from coming to church. The answers were boredom, lack of welcome for visitors, inadequate programs for children. It is with these concerns that the church began with a Bible study group in their in their uh, condo. Uh, the first service took place in their condo and now has more than 20, 22,000 people. Rick Warren gives 90% of his income away to the charity of his church. And his church does a lot of ministries with the poor in their community. Uh, this church meets, you know, it had no condemnation at all. You know, the, the church from Philadelphia had no condemnation at all. And I, I feel like Rick Warren touched on everything that he needed to touch on for, for uh, the growth of his church, a spirit-filled church, uh, a church that had faith in God, uh, and it was faithful. That's all I have. Hello? Amen. Well, that's, that's plenty. Yes, that's plenty. And it's absolutely true. The church at Philadelphia had kept uh, Christ's word. They had not denied his name. They were patient, patient in giving out the truth of God's word, both in worship and in uh, missionary performance. And so uh, Christ declared that if you are going to worship me in spirit and in truth, and then obey me in missionary work by going out among the poor and going out among those uh, who uh, want to or need to find God, then you will be pillars in the temple of God. And so uh, he commended with no condemnation this faithful evangelistic church. Uh, And so uh, Saddleback is certainly that type of church. Uh, When uh, we visited Saddleback, uh, the first time we visited there, uh, you know, what you might find unusual is that they had different buildings on the property. They had all this huge property, acres of land, but they had different churches on the property, church buildings. And in front of one church building, you might see <clears throat> motorcycles and people in leather with beards and wraps around their head and, and uh, looking like uh, motor bikers going into one church, you go to another church, you see just a bunch of young people going in there with uh, loud music and and fast beat, and then you go to another building and you'll see people with suits and ties and dresses going in like traditional worshipers. And so they created this, whatever tradition you went to, whatever way you felt comfortable in coming in and serving God, there was a church building that you could go into and do that. And so 
all these different types of worship took place at the same time, but oh, there was only one message. Rick Warren uh, would be videotaped to all of the buildings when it came time to bring the word of God or to bring the study of God. So everybody got the same word, but you worshiped in whatever uh, tradition you felt comfortable in worshiping in, and, and it seemed to have worked very well. They just wanted to bring people to Jesus Christ. And I love that he reversed tithes because his book was so powerful. He got so much money from that book. It sold millions of copies. And then another one that sold millions of copies that uh, he reversed tithes and gave 90% to the church, kept 10% to himself. And so we know that he is a faithful, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. So this is an excellent church. So we thank you, uh, Sheila, for uh, your report. You know, my honey pot. Yeah, we thank you for that. Um, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna move on uh, to Leo Decia. Is a- Adrian? Are you with us this morning? Yes, sir. I am. <laughs> all right, all right. So, will you uh, take us to the final church then, um, Leo Decia? Yes, indeed. And I I agree with Sister Shilton when she said, um, "I just thought you were going on to a different day." Um, Lace or Deer. Uh, I wrote Lace or Deer as a warm church, which is cheerful in greeting and receiving their members, in more of a club style routine <clears throat> ministry. They would congregate as a unit family every Sunday, faithfully well dressed for the ceremonial. Um, ceremonial. Uh, what did I write? <laughs> uh, activities of the service. Each member knows and acts their role in leadership and praise and worship, but the presence of the Holy Spirit is absent. Everyone knows when to sit, stand, and recite ceremonial creeds in the church service, but the fiery desire for Christ Jesus has been replaced with worldly desires of things and tithes and possessions, which is a little conflicting now putting tithes there. I have to work on that. The con- congregational members burn with fire in possession about their new suits they purchase for Sunday services. Men and women would consult one another about their hairdos and fashion outfits and they very little asked each other about the concerns of each other's lives during the course of the week. They were aware, but they didn't engage in actively assisting. Their passion for their fire, for desire for Christ Jesus' concern for the spirit soul of their members has burned to a very low, not recognizable flame. What church in <laughs> So what kind of car they would ask each other, what kind of car do you drive? Washing your cars every Saturday to be prepared to parade it on Sunday. Their focus was more on their things and their riches and their possessions. People in this church know that God exists and they love him with their mouths by confession, by confessing he is alive. They show their passion for Jesus Christ by doing good works and services works on committees in the church. But Jesus Christ's spirit in the presence of the people, the church was in lack. It was absent. Jesus Christ is not first in their daily activities to appreciate his love and hold on to his passionate love for you. They would arise on Sunday morning and get dressed or whatever day during the week. I've heard it say that folks would put on their beautiful attires, whether it was beautiful to one another, and then they would... (laughs) At the last moment, before they leave their home, they would put on their Christianity like you put a chain around your neck. 
and then walk out the door. So it says that the, they just simply did not understand that the passion that was in them, the light for Christ, was absent. Okay, Pastor. Amen, amen, Adrian. I, that's an excellent uh, uh, observation and portrayal of uh, Laodicea, of a lukewarm church. We appreciate that report. And I love that image, the image of putting on that gold chain as the attire of Christianity. So when, when mm-hmm. I leave my house, I'm going to put on the attire of Christianity, uh, something I can just as easily take off. Uh, yeah. whenever I, I want to. It's not uh, ingested. It's not in me. It's an outward expression that I can change anytime I want. Um, I think that is absolutely the fact of a lukewarm church and the danger of a lukewarm church because, or you know, this is church or person. Church can be person uh, because it means that it's not in your heart. You can confess Jesus Christ with your mouth. Most people don't know this. You can confess Jesus Christ with your mouth, but if you don't mm-hmm. believe in your heart, you have not uh, been saved. And so there are people that will confess with their mouth, but they don't believe in their heart, and, and they are not saved. But they'll go through 20, 30, 40, 50 years thinking they're saved uh, without uh, being possessed of the Holy Spirit of the living God which you mentioned when you first started out, Adrian. And if the Holy Spirit is absent in the church, that means God is absent because the Holy Spirit is God. And so if the Holy Spirit is not in the church, then God is not in the church. And there are churches that are more like a club than a congregation of believers. They they are a club. I go to this club the same way I might go to the Elks Club or the Diners Club or it's my place to hang out. I have, I have a fellowship there. I feel comfortable there. I have friends there. We have uh, meals there, and we talk about the day's events there. And so it's a focus of soul. Everybody has a soul. Your soul is your personality. It's a focus of soul and flesh. Like you said, what clothes do you have on? What car do you drive? It's a focus of your soul and your soul being, your personality being focused on fleshly or worldly things. What's missing is the spirit. The spirit is our communion with God. We are triune beings. We are spirit, soul, and body. First Thessalonians 5 and 23 will tell you that. We are spirit, soul, and body. And so once we focus on just the soul and the body and don't give uh, – humility or obeisance to the spirit that is in us, uh, then we are not connected or communing with God. So uh, that is the problem with being lukewarm, and God calls being lukewarm wretched, poor, blind, and naked because their whole vision is on this world and not on the truth of the word of God. When I think of a lukewarm church, I think of uh, Scientology. Scientology, mm. which which professes this great, uh, tremendous uh, faith in in knowledge, in knowledge, and that is their salvation, knowledge, not faith in God. So they are not saved, and they will never be saved because they have not let Jesus Christ into their life as Savior and Lord. So we want to thank our final two uh, uh, leaders. Uh, for the the sixth church and the seventh church, Philadelphia and Laodicea. So, beloved, that are on the line, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about either one of those churches, feel free to come off mute and um, speak to our leaders before we go on. Well, uh, Pastor Doug, good morning. This is Karen. I don't have a question, but I when you uh, mentioned the... Uh, Scientology, I was also wondering, could the Mormon church be uh, added to that as as lukewarm? Absolutely. A lukewarm church, okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, professing to be Christians, but
but not receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Anyone who, uh, Jehovah's Witness, anyone who's professing to be a Christian but not receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior would be a lukewarm church. Even a church that professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they don't believe it in their heart, they don't live it as a reality, um, they would also be a lukewarm church. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Pastor. Um, Philadelphia Church, the people were so demonstrative of Christ's love. And you made mention that Rick Warren, I remember they used to use that in the CR program as his um, seven, I think seven steps, something. And I'm just kind of thinking to myself, his model with being able to set up buildings where the people could be greeted in their particular lifestyle they were living in now, how they saw themselves. Is that what he was really doing? He was giving them the ability to be able to be greeted on the level that they were living on, not to say that my lifestyle is better or higher than somebody else's because I dress that way, but it was more somehow more visibly uh, uh, attracted to them to come in and embrace. Yes, that's exactly true, uh, Adrian. Uh, His idea was that you uh, be comfortable in who you are. You can still have your traditions and your customs as long as they are sublimated to the worship of God. As long as, first of all, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. As long as you do that, remember, they all got the same word at the same time. Mm. And so uh, this biker that had his, his, uh, his leather on and he fell off of his, his Harley Davidson and fell into church, uh, he understood that he could be loved just like that. God could meet him where he was. And the uh, people that wanted to put on a shirt and tie, because that's how they grew up, and that's how they went to church, and that's, they, they considered that giving God their best, that they could also um, meet Jesus where they were. His idea was, uh, we're not going to let the, the, the traditions and customs of the world stop us from worshiping God. What we're going to do is we're going to relegate those traditions and customs below putting God first. And, and putting the word of God first and the true worship of God. That, was the, that is the focus of Saddleback. Uh, the focus of Saddleback is uh, purposeful living. What's that book he wrote, The Purpose Driven Church? And so your purpose yeah. is to live for God. So your purpose is to live for God. And so uh, Jesus said, come as you are. It doesn't really matter. I, you know, and I've gone through this with some pastors too. You, you know, if the kids come to church in, in dungarees and sneakers, so what? They've come to find Jesus Christ. And so as long as they find Jesus Christ uh, and they worship in spirit and his truth, then the rest of that stuff, we're not going to uh, be overly concerned with it. Not overly concerned with the length of your dress. I'm concerned with do you love God and are you following the word of God? Because after you love God and you're following the word of God, the Holy Spirit will talk to you about the length of your dress. That's not my business between you and God. So those, those things, I think, as long as they're relegated to loving God first, as uh, Minister Brenda opened us up today, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, on these two laws rest all the law and the words of the prophets. So if you can do those things, then all the law of God will be covered through his grace and his mercy towards you. So could it honestly be something where as the churches, even smaller congregations, 22,000 is extraordinary. So it, on smaller levels, could they really start putting their focus towards making it more visible 
two different groups and still be in the same building even? Yes. Uh, I think that's why you have those various groups in some of the mega churches. You have affinity groups. Uh, uh, people come together in small groups, even though they're in a mega church. They might have certain interests that draw them to one group. Uh, but each group has Bible study. Each group has prayer meeting. Each group uh, comes to hear the same message from the senior pastor. Uh, I firmly believe that any church that grows over a few thousand people, you should have a breakup somewhere. Somewhere in there should be a breakup where people can actually get to know one another, uh, fellowship with one another, uh, meet one another, have prayer and, and uh, uh, Bible study together. Uh, know each other by name and be there for each other in emergencies. Like if I'm if I'm in a, a church that has ten thousand people, but I'm in a group. I, I'm in a group that has uh, ten people, twelve people. If I get sick and I'm in the hospital and I got ten, twelve people that I have fellowship with all the time that I can call that will help me, that will let me uh, uh, be known to the pastor or the or the executive pastor, whatever. There has to be that closeness and fellowship, I believe, even in a huge mega church. If you don't, it becomes not really uh, sincere worship. It becomes more uh, for show and fashion. We keep them by uh, entertainment that's really good, good singers, good band, good uh, worship. We keep them by great preaching, but we're not living for Jesus. Uh, there has to be a smaller group, I believe. To help you live. Amen on that. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Okay. So uh, that's the churches. That's the churches. So we are going to move then to uh, chapter four of Revelation, lesson ten, on page forty-five. We can at least get started on it this morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Gloria once again for looking out. Good, good move, Gloria. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're going to take off with John, the Revelator, to the throne room of God. Um, and as I ask if someone would read Revelation four one through eleven from either Old King James or New King James version, please. Uh, this is Karen, and I have the King James version. Uh, Chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, pardon me, as it were a trumpet talking with me. It said, Come hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and on one sat on and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow around about the throne in sight like unto an emerald and round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like into crystal, and in the midst of the throne and Round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Ten, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship 
him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. Amen. So uh, John the Revelator has been lifted up to the throne room of God. He actually sets eyes upon the most holy sitting on the throne of the Lord. Now, remember our key verse, right? Uh, And we're going to talk about that as we start. We are now in Revelation 4, 1 through 11, and we're going to begin exegeting um, this pericope. So we'll begin exegeting it. Uh, We're going to go to our, our workbooks at 45 page 45, the top of page 45. Uh, It says in chapter 1 of Revelation, John is commanded to write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. That is the basic outline of the book of Revelation. That's That's the key text, the key verse to the book of Revelation 1 and 19. Um. The things which thou hast seen refers to the vision of the glorified Christ that John saw in chapter 1. He saw the glorified Christ with hair like wool, white like wool, and feet like burned uh, bronze, and he was magnificent. The same John that walked with Jesus and leaned on his breast, the same John that ate with him at supper and and, and, uh, was with him at the cross of Calvary, the same John that knew him as a human being. When he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ in his glory, John fell at his feet as if dead. And so what he's told in 1 and 19 is to remember those things which thou hast seen. In other words, remember that you have seen the glorified Christ. Remember that you have seen the crucifixion and the resurrection. Remember that you have seen Jesus raise the dead. Remember the miracles that were done by him as he walked upon this earth. Remember his transfiguration and remember his ascension back to the right hand of the Father. So the first thing you must remember is the things that he has seen. Then it goes on and says the things which are. Remember the things which are. And the things which are refers to the letters of the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3. These letters describe the seven kinds of churches and Christians who will exist throughout the church age. And so he is also to remember the things that are. And the things that are are the church age. He was living in the church age, and we are living in the church age. All of this time period before the transition comes to the kingdom of God is the church age. Uh, And we are secured in the church age by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has allowed us to become disciples of his. He has allowed us to become followers of God. He has covered us and is keeping us to the glory of the Most High shall be on earth just like it is in heaven. So remember the things that are the church. We are the church. And then he says to remember the things which shall be hereafter. And this begins in chapter 4 and verse 1, where we are right now. Everything in Revelation from this point forward is future tense. This hereafter is the time that is coming, and I believe shortly to come. So John looks. He sees a door standing open in heaven. And then he hears a voice like a trumpet speaking to him. Uh, And what does that voice say? Does anybody have that? Yes, this is Gloria. It says, come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. Okay, hereafter. Uh, In your book at 45, that word hereafter refers to what will happen after the church age. After the church age, something else is going to happen. This gives credence to the view that John's going up to heaven is a picture of the future rapture of the church. John is sort of representing 
uh, what you and I are going to go through when Jesus cracks the sky and calls for his spirit from the northeast, south, and west, and those who possess the spirit of God shall rise to meet him in the middle of the air. So this view is reinforced by the fact that in chapters 2 and 3, the churches are the central theme. Remember, we've just finished the seven churches. All of that, chapters 2 and 3, it all talked about the church, the church, the church, the church, this church, that church, Ephesus, Laodicea, Philadelphia. It was all about the church. How after, how, however, rather, after chapter 3, the churches disappear. They're just gone. They're just gone. Here in, in chapter 4, you're not going to hear anything about the church. The next time the church is mentioned, she will be mentioned not on earth, but in heaven as the bride of Christ. And that will not happen until Revelation 19. And so we've learned all about the churches. That's the church age. Here in 4, from now on, you don't hear a mumbling word about the church until we see the church returning in glory with Christ in uh, Revelation 19. Okay, so the question is, how does she get to heaven with Christ? And this mystery is explained in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. The rapture will occur with the sound of the trump of God that connects with John writing, he hears a voice speaking to him like a trumpet. And at the rapture, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We get this in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. And then uh, the question is, what happens to believers? What happens to believers who are still living on earth? Uh, Does anyone have that? This is Cynthia. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 a and b. It says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. Amen. So we know that the Lord will descend from heaven. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then anyone who's alive and in Christ is going to be caught up with the dead in Christ and meet Jesus in the clouds in the air. Now, the, this mystery, this mystery of happening, this truth according to the word of God, we call it the rapture. We call it the rapture. Now, I'm aware that the word rapture is not found in the New Testament. It's not found in the Bible. Uh, But it comes from a Latin word, uh, rapere, which means to be caught up. It means to be snatched away. So the word doesn't appear but the uh, demonstration of the act appears all over the Bible. So let's just take a quick look at uh, one part of explaining the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, if somebody would read uh, verses 42 through 55, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verses 42 through 55. This is Minister uh, Brenda, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42, 35. No, I'm sorry. The verse again? 42 through 55. Oh, 55. Okay, thank you. And it reads, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is shown in corruption. in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, the last Adam, became became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was of the earth. 
made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are made of dust. And as it and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of death, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet was sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on, on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall, then shall be brought to pass those things that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Amen, the word of God. Amen. And so we uh, begin to get a description of what will happen uh, when Jesus comes back for his own. And, of course, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 uh, gets into it even more clearly. So the idea of rapture uh, is very clear in the Bible. Some people point out that the word is not there. But when they say that the word is not there, I say uh, the word missionary is not in the Bible either. Uh, and God has told us to be missionaries. Uh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible either, but we know that there's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Bible gives evidence of the rapture. It does not call it by name. Uh, for example, when Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach my gospel, he didn't call it being a missionary, but that's surely what he described. And so what we're going to see in chapters 4 and 5 uh, we're going to see heaven. Uh, after the rapture, there will be those who love the Lord, those who love God, whom God uh, has appeared to and given his spirit to. They will appear before God in heaven. And this is the prelude to the great tribulation, the judgment of the world, which shall happen, and we'll begin in chapter 6. In chapter 6, we'll begin to see the great tribulation on earth. But before that, uh, we will be with Jesus. Revelation 4 and 1 symbolically represents the church as being snatched away into heaven. And from now on, the church will not be mentioned at all until chapter 19. And when she is mentioned, you will find her in heaven with Jesus. Okay, so going to the last, um, sentence in uh, page 45 So the word rapture Refers Now we're on top of page 46 The snatching away of the church From earth And then the question is asked How does the Lord Jesus Describe the rapture He describes it in Matthew 24 and 40 How does Jesus describe it Does anyone have it? This is Minister Brenda in 24 and 40. He says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Amen. So Jesus lets us know that some will be taken unto him, and others will be left. This is the Lord keeping his promise to his church. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. Um, blessed be the name of God. Uh, we, we hear this when God says, uh, lead us not into temptation, we pray to God. Lead us not 
into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. That is what we're talking about here. There will come an hour of great temptation upon the earth in, in the great tribulation period. Um, so we ask God to keep us from the hour of temptation. Lead us not into temptation, Lord God. Uh, this temptation will come upon all the world, and it will be a great tribulation. But we pray that God keep us from this evil. Uh, therefore, we can conclude the church will be raptured before the great tribulation that is described in chapters 6 through 19. Okay, so we're going to leave it there for today, discussion of the rapture. Any questions, comments, or concerns about the rapture? Pastor Banks, uh, this is yes. Dorothy. Uh, can you answer this? Because I was listening to Dr. Robert uh, Jeffrey, uh, and he was talking about one being taken, one left in the field. And he said that the one that will be taken will actually go into judgment, and the one left is the one that when, God, when Jesus is coming, he's the one that would ask for them to come up. And I didn't understand that, and maybe I, I'm hoping that maybe when I go back and listen to him again that I would get some clarity. But have you? can you just explain when we're talking about, because I was under the impression that when one is left, and one go, is that the one that uh, goes is going actually to meet Jesus. Am I incorrect, or what is the correct interpretation of the, the well, one the, that the, the, Right. There, there are many people who believe with me and with the author of this book uh, that that's describing the rapture. That's what we believe. But there are premillennial people. There are postmillennial people. There are amillennial people. So for those who believe, a premillennial means that we will go in the rapture to heaven before the great tribulation. There are postmillennial people who believe that the church will go through the great tribulation. There are amillennial people who believe that we are now living in the great tribulation right now as, as exists. But biblically, if you just go by the word of God, the word of God more clearly defines premillennial. And so that's where I stand, and I believe that's where the word of God stands, and that's why I stand there. I believe the church will be raptured. So when I read this, uh, I believe that the, Jesus is describing the rapture. Now, there are people who don't believe that that's the rapture. They believe it's something else, that it is the coming, uh, Jesus is coming to get those uh, who deserve judgment and will be taken away to judgment. And the ones that are left will be uh, his people who are left on, on earth. And they, they believe that because they don't believe in the rapture, really, uh, or in the rapture coming before the tribulation. So it, what's correct is, for me, is what does the word of God teach, uh, rather than my own tradition, my own custom, my own church, my own doctrine, uh, what does the word of God teach? And when you begin to do the research into the word of God, when you exegete the word of God, which is what we're doing right now, when you exegete the word of God, the most clear understanding is there is a rapture. Like I said, there is no word rapture in the Bible, but there is certainly rapture described uh, over and over again from 1 Corinthians to 1 Thessalonians to Matthew chapter 24, the, the word uh, rapture may not be there, but the idea, the concept of rapture is clear in the Bible. Uh, and so that's where I stand. Pastor, this is Gloria. And um, in my um, spirit, life in the spirit Bible, um, in, the, in the reference to verse 40, of what she's talking about or uh, inquiring about. Part of it says that um, these words likely refer to the church saints who are taken up from among the wicked when Christ calls the faithful to him at the rapture. And then it says to see John 14 and 3. And John 14 and 3 says, 
and this is in red, which we know Jesus is speaking. It says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So I just wanted to bring that out, maybe to help to show that it um, agrees with what you are saying. Amen, and I appreciate that, Gloria. And it's absolutely true. And that's why I believe the rapture, because you can find it in the Word of God, and you can find it on the lips of Jesus Christ. And so my interpretation of anything in the Bible depends on Scripture uh, defining Scripture, Scripture solving Scripture. And so as Gloria pointed out, there's that in John 14, and then there are other scriptures, and they all point to the rapture. Good morning, Pastor. Oh, my God. This is Deborah. I just wanted to know, what was that, um, John, uh, the scripture? John 14 and 3. Thank you. Good morning, Pastor. I was thinking of that one comment that you made in earlier where as we enter into the chapter 4 of Revelations and we don't come back to the churches until the 19th chapter, I'm thinking my understanding is Christ is saying, I want you to take your focus off your situations on earth because I need you to concentrate on what is coming before you in heaven. Amen. And, and, and not only that, it removes us from the great tribulation because judgment is about to come. We're going to read about heaven in, in chapters uh, 4 and 5, but beginning in chapter 6, judgment is coming on the earth. And Christ has already promised that we would be spared that, that his church would not have to go through that in my reading of the word of God. And he says it over and over again in various places. So um, we, are, we don't have to go through that tribulation according to my understanding of the word of God. And it's reinforced by the word of God. So I, I uh, stand there. Okay, Amen. anything else? Yes, this is Opal. Can I ask a question? Sure. This is regarding the church. The church. Um, and Maybe you can clarify for me. Uh, during this pandemic, everybody is, the churches are filing suits, you know, for people to congregate in the church. And so I'm kind of a little bit um, confused as to why they're doing that. If the Bible says that you are the church. Am I missing something? Well, they want to assemble. Their, their, their idea is that we have a right to assemble. And their argument before the Supreme Court, and they won, by the way, their argument before the Supreme Court is how can you tell churches not to assemble when you have not closed bars, you have not closed indoor restaurants, and so how can you come and tell the churches not to assemble? You close schools and you close churches, but you're letting um, bars and, and restaurants and businesses stay open. That is, uh, that is not fair, and, it's, and you don't have the right to do that. And so they took that to the Supreme Court, and they won. And now why people want to gather together is that they Amen. are not really looking at the, um, uh, the health concerns as much as some people, and they are – looking at assembling together. They have a right to assemble together. They may not want to do it on this new platform um, called Zoom or Facebook or whatever. They, they want to physically assemble together, and they don't believe that uh, the law, the secular world, has the right to tell them they cannot do that, uh, especially if they're allowing people to assemble for other reasons. Why are you picking on the church? or schools if you're letting other people assemble. And uh, in that case, I think they're right. It has to be one way completely for everybody. Amen. Okay, I was looking at it a different way. Okay, good. Thanks. 
Okay, anybody else? Okay, then let us, let us thank God for uh, the rapture. God has promised. Lord God, we thank you, and we, we pray right now that you continue to uh, demonstrate your word before us, that you would save us from the hour of great temptation. You would keep us from all evil. Uh, your kingdom will come on earth just as it is in heaven, and we come this morning to give you praise and glory for loving us enough to rescue us from this great judgment which we are about to see uh, revealed in your word. We bless the name of Jesus Christ who has allowed John, who uh, is the beloved uh, disciple, to come before the throne of God. We have seen God in his glory through the eyes of he who bore witness uh, for the church. And we come to bless your name, and we ask that you uh, give us strength to exegete uh, this very mysterious revelation. Uh, Uncover, Lord God, uncover. Allow us to see. Reveal to us the glory of God and the saving power of the Most High. Reveal to us, Lord, the face of God uh, as we prepare uh, for the coming judgment on earth. Bless us, Lord God. Do not take our hand from your hand. Allow us to walk and talk with you in the garden. Oh, God, be with us in spite of all temptation. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 Everybody have a wonderful day today.